On today's episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, we're going to be talking about tonality. How you say what you say is just as important, maybe even more important than what it is that you're saying. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hi there, and welcome to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Today I want to talk to you about something that you know, you definitely know, but you don't necessarily know that you know, or maybe you do know that you know it, but maybe you don't put it to practice as much as you might, as you could, or or maybe you do. <laughs> maybe you're an expert. Maybe you're better at it than I am. Uh, it could very well be the case. And... What I want to talk to you about is not content about what you say, but actually how you say it. In the world of NLP, if you're familiar with NLP at all, you're probably familiar with a study that was done that is um, flawed at best, but nevertheless gives us a pretty good kind of estimation of what communication uh, is comprised of. So as, as an example, if, if I was to say, um, I, I love you to my wife or to someone else, anyone at all. If I was to say I love you, but I said it like, I love you, I really love you. You know, the communication is not very congruent, is it? So what we're talking about is this study that was done that said what gets communicated is only 7% the words that are chosen to be said. A much larger percentage. Now, the study, like I said, is flawed, but it says 38% of the communication is the tonality with which you say it. And then the biggest part of the communication is the body language, is the physiology with, with which you say what you're saying. So you're going to have to imagine this. This is an audio uh, podcast, so we don't have that 55% of visual um, nonverbal communication. But if you were to imagine that if I was to uh, have a, a very pained look on my face and shaking my head from side to side, and maybe even a little color in my face, you know, and and I'm saying, I'm really excited that your mother is going to come and spend a few days with us, darling. You know, if my um, wife's mother was coming to visit, and, and I'm not that fond of my in-laws, right? I might be saying perfectly nice things, Right, like the words say, I'm very happy that your mother is going to spend a few days with us, but the pained look on my face, my f- shaking my head back and forth, and the tonality with which I say it communicate something very else entirely, don't they? I'm really happy that your mother's coming to stay. Yeah. So, because my wife knows me very well, she would. Um, you know, I've killed me by now, practically, with that sort of communication. Um, not really. No, I'm just kidding, because, you know, anyway, it's a moot point. My wife's mother has been dead a long time. But the point is that the communication is the is is generated by how you say it. So what's interesting about this fact, this, this truth, whether or not the statistics are exactly, you know, 7 38 and 55, whether that's precise or not is not the question. It is true that how you say something matters more than what it is that you say. And think about it. A lot of times these days we get texts, right? We get a lot of uh, emails. I remember speaking to my wife and she'll kill me if she ever hears me say this, but um, she's not as violent as I'm making her out to be just as as an aside. Um metaphorically kill me, she, she would not be happy with me if she knew that I was telling secrets here. But she is sometimes coming to me very upset about something she has read in a text and said, can you believe he said this to me? He said, how, what do you know with this? And I said, well, how, how do you know he, he said it like that? How, maybe he said it like, uh, what are you doing with this? Or what are you doing with this? Or what are you doing with this? 
Or what are you doing with this? Or what are you doing with this? He could have said it a whole bunch of different ways, right? You don't know from a text, do you? That's one of the dangers of text, isn't it? We can we can attribute lots of things to, you know, the printed word that isn't necessarily there. Right? So it's really useful to be aware of how you come across, what you're saying, how you're saying what you're saying. And what's interesting about this to me is that um, very often I've seen in NLP trainings throughout the world, really, where people talk about this. They say the much more important part of, of the communication is how you say it. And the only 7% is the word choices. And then they spend the majority of the training talking about that 7%. You know, what to say, what are the scripts to say, what are the words to say, what are the steps in order in the syntax for the six-step reframe. You know, it's, it's all about that content rather than how you say it. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how to be aware of your tonality and how to perhaps practice ways you can use more effective tonality as a coach. Because as a coach, you want to be the best communicator possible, right? It, it's in your own best interest, and it's certainly in your client's best interests to be able to be the best communicator possible. And that means utilize your voice effectively. Now, in the world of NLP, there's also an understanding of Ericksonian hypnotic language patterns. Milton Erickson, as you probably know if you're listening to this podcast, Milton Erickson was a, a genius of the 20th century, uh, you know, best hypnotist ever probably, and um, and really responsible for putting hypnosis back on the map as far as uh, uh, acceptance within the medical community. Certainly he was himself a doctor, um, psychiatrist and medical doctor and used hypnosis in a different way than most people ever did and uh, really revolutionized things and, and, and brought it back. It gave it a sense of res respectability that it had lost after Freud sort of put it on the back burner with his poo-pooing of it all back in the uh, early part of the 20th century, 1900s. Um, Freud really made people believe that in order to do effective therapy, you had to do psychoanalysis and, you know, regurgitate and bring back all these uh, uh, thoughts from your past, et cetera, and analyze things. He learned hypnosis. Part of the theory of his unco of the unconscious came from his study of hypnosis, but he didn't think it was that effective for his analytical therapy. You know, his going back into the past and bringing stuff up to this conscious surface to analyze it and to get insight about it. So therefore, he said, no, nah, don't do hypnosis. And many people were hypnotized by him, effectively speaking, to think, yeah, that's how you do therapy, what Freud said. You know, so hypnosis was put on the back burner and put into the, you know, the county fairs and that sort of stuff. So it really wasn't until Milton Erickson came along that it, you know, got some respectability back again. And much of what you know from NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, is derived from Erickson's work. So NLP looked at, very closely looked at how Erickson was doing what he did. They tried to, effectively as possible, model what he did. And they noticed how he used his tonality, how he used inflections of his voice. He would say things in certain ways that gave across different meanings. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of that today. It's a whole big subject, but I want you to be aware of a few things about that about tonality and how about how you can use it in your coaching practice, whether or not you ever do hypnosis. It's just effective communication. Okay? So one of the things we do in NLP is we help people to get into different states, different states of minds, different emotional states. So as an example, when you're in a flow state, when you remember being in a flow state, when you're just like really really in the, in, the, in, the, in the flow of things, when things are going really smoothly. You're not barely even having to think about it. You're just doing it. Just things happen, and it's great. You've been in states like this. We're in a flow state like that. That's a great state to be in for anything, certainly as a coach. And then there are times when we're not in such a great state, and maybe we got some bad news, or maybe we ate something that didn't agree with us. Maybe we stayed up too late last night. Maybe we... Drank a few too many celebratory 
margaritas or something, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, we're not at our best. And you're not in a flow state and things are kind of not working so good, right? That's the difference between state and when we want to be in a good state to get something done, we want to be able to control our state. We also want to be able to elicit that state from our clients, don't we? So we want to be able to help get them into a great state. Now, one of the ways you help a person change their state is by you going first. You elicit it from them. You sort of inspire it from them by using your voice. Now, if you, like me, do most of your coaching either on telephone or on Zoom, it's going to be very important, obviously, to be able to use your voice effectively because maybe you don't have much, you know, physical presence with your client at the moment. Maybe it's a visual on Zoom or something, but, you know, probably that's the best you can hope for. So when you're doing therapy, when you're doing coaching, when you're talking with somebody and you want to be able to change their state and elicit that state from them, you want to be able to use your voice to elicit it and get them in that state. So as an example, if I wanted to get a client into a fully empowered state, and I said to something like them, like said something to them like, do you remember a time when you were totally powerful, when you felt totally, you know, jazzed and powerful? Do you remember a time like that? Go to a time like that now. Right? And if I said that like this, remember a time when you felt totally jazzed and psyched and in a great state? Well, go to that time now. You know, if I just was in a you know, <laughs> down state myself. And, and even though I was saying the right words and it wasn't come out like I was, you know, embodying it myself, it wouldn't work very well. I see this with hypnotists all the time. Hypnotists, you know, have a way of talking hypnotically. So it's like, yes, and you can go into trance. As I count down from 10 to 1, you'll go deeper and deeper. And, you know, they talk like that. So <laughs> it's kind of funny sometimes when they're trying to do coaching and they're saying, hey, get yourself in a fully resourceful state. Remember a time when you're like totally jazzed and, and <laughs> they're going like, remember a time when you're totally jazzed? It just doesn't work. You got to you gotta embody it with your own voice. It's got to come out. You know, it's kind of like in a theater. You know, they they talk about how it has to get across the footlights, the, the emotions, what you're trying to say has to get across the footlights, it gets across from the, the brink of the stage out to the audience. And in a, you know, live theater thing, it needs to get beyond the footlights and up to the balcony, right? You got to, you know, got to emote, you got to, you know, use your body, use your language to get it out. Same thing is true when you're talking with someone. That's why, I don't know if you know this or not, but probably you do. Um, a lot of salespeople, when they're, you know, doing phone sales and cold calls and stuff, they're on their feet. They're, they're not sitting at a chair. You know, they're not sitting in a chair at a desk or whatever. They're standing up. Maybe they've even got a, a mirror with a, you know, sign on it that says, smile. I know I used to do that. You know, when I was in sales, I used to do that. So you, you, you'd smile and you embody it with your body. Why? Because it comes across the footlights. Your vocal tonality will be changed by your physiology, whether or not the person sees it. So if you're up and moving and gesticulating and smiling and, you know, feeling pumped, it's going to come across through your voice. Purely auditorily, purely auditorily. And that's really important. You want to be able to get that across. Now, one of the things I'm also doing with my voice right now that you might be noticing is I'm, I'm articulating and, and, and amplifying. What's the word I'm looking for? I'm uh, emphasizing certain words with my tonality. Have you noticed that? I'm emphasizing certain words. So I'm emphasizing certain words. I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing certain words. So if you want to really get it, right? There you go. If you want to really get it, and I could just say it, if you want to really get it, then you have to really you know, change your tonality. You don't say it like that, though. If you want to get it, you emphasize the word get like that. So the tonality shifts are vital, vital. You want to um, embody what it is you're trying to say and get it across the footlights through your tonality. Embodying it first. Use your own physiology in the moment to get it across. Now, 
So get a little bit more subtle with it. One of the things we do in Ericksonian hypnosis and neurolinguistic programming is we give subtle suggestions through the use of what we call embedded commands. Embedded commands. To embed a command within a sentence is a little artful. Sometimes people refer to it as uh, coercive. No, what's the word? Um, it'll come to me in a minute. It's not, though. It's it's not... I'm sorry, I can't think of the word. But it's um, it's like coercive, coercive, where you're coercing someone, where you're being sneaky. But the for- fact of the matter is, when you're doing using your voice like this, you are being paid by your coach client to, in a sense, manipulate them, to help them, to help them change in a positive way. That's your job. That's what they're paying you for. So, yes, be manipulative (laughs) in a good way, right? It's manipulative because that's what they're paying you for. That's what they're paying you for. If you go to a chiropractor, right? What's a chiropractor do? He manipulates, she manipulates your spinal cord or other parts of your body with his or her hands, right? She manipulates the, the structure to make a positive change. We do that with our coaching. We manipulate, in a good way, our clients in order for them to change the way that they want to change. They are paying you for this. So it's your duty to do it well. It is. So when I think of that word that's like coercive, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. But right now I can't think of it. The word is covert. But just suffice it to say, it's, it's, it's done with positive intent. So a command, if I was to talk about, you know, embedded command, first I'm going to talk about a straight command. If I have a dog here, oh, oh hey, Spot, hey, come here, come here, come here. Hey, sit, Spot, Spot, look at me. Sit down, sit, sit, right? That sit tonality is commanding tonality. I'm telling Spot to sit down. Good dog. Who's a good boy? Who's a good boy? Right? I'm telling Spot to sit down. Now, I, I don't actually have a dog. I'm just hallucinating my dog here. But um, and if I did have a dog, I would definitely name him Spot. I, I don't know too many dog owners who have named their dog Spot. I, I really have not. Um, it's sort of the classic name for a dog, and yet never met one. Anyway, that's just an aside. If I wanted anyone to sit down, I would still use command tonality. I'd tell them, hey, Bob, sit, have a seat. You know, (laughs) I'd tell whoever it is to sit down. I wouldn't say, Bob, sit down. I might say that because I'm asking. I might be being polite. But that's what a tonality that goes up is. It's a question, isn't it? Isn't it? It's a question, isn't it? The tonality goes up at the end of the sentence, right? That's what a question does. Command tonality goes down. Command tonality goes down at the end of the sentence. So if I say... I want you to go into trance. That's not going to be a particularly effective way to say it. If I said, I want you to go into trance, then you get it. I'm telling you to go into trance, right? Now, that's not particularly artful. It's not particularly, you know, subtle. I'm giving you a direct command, go into trance. You know, we want to perhaps be a little bit more subtle with our embedded commands than that. We want to embed the command within the sentence of a structure. Now, speaking of my dog Spot, Spot, who's a good dog? Spot here is not like pills. You know, have you ever had a dog? Have you ever had a cat? Um, I've had cats where you try to give them a pill, and it's like you're not going to do it. And and um, but dogs are far easier. With a dog, what you do with a dog is you take your pill, and you take like you know a little handful of dog food or hamburger or something like that. And you put the pill inside of it, right? And you say, hey, here, here, catch, catch, jet. And they'll just wolf it down. Won't even think about it. The pill's inside spot, right? The pill was embedded in the hamburger. We want to embed a command within the sentence so the person will just swallow it. Does it make sense? So we put the command into the middle of a sentence where they won't quite notice it. But we want to still use our tonality to make sure their unconscious mind does get it, right? We want to use that command 
tone down to make sure that the suggestion we're offering is noticed by the unconscious mind and accepted as a command. So if I was to say to my friend Bob, who's who's coming in, uh, oh, here he is. If I say, Bob, sit down, that's a direct command, right? We've covered that already. And if I said to him, Bob, you know, people can sit down and get comfortable anytime you want. So I'm talking to him about people can, you know, it's just a matter of fact statement. People can sit down and get comfortable anytime they want, right? But within that matter of fact, statement of truth, people can sit down and get comfortable anytime they want. I'm saying, Bob, people can sit down and get comfortable at any time they want. So that sit down is is separated out from the rest of the thing. It's marked out and it has that command tone down to make it be uh, heard and appreciated by the unconscious mind, by Bob's unconscious mind in this case, that it's time to sit down. And Maybe even go into trance, because I did mention that obliquely, didn't it? So, we want to use this tonality shift to give positive suggestions in good, appropriate, and uh, positive ways. I said positive already, but you know what I'm talking about. Now, one of the things we do in class, when I teach Ericksonian hypnosis classes, or what I call these days neo-Ericksonian hypnosis classes, is we practice this. We practice this because it's a funny thing. But sometimes people don't quite notice how they sound when they're speaking. I don't know if you know, because people don't notice. Like, I don't know if it's subconscious, but, but they think they're doing something pretty extraordinary with their tonality, and it just doesn't come across the footlights. You know, the, the audience doesn't hear it. They don't hear it. It's not good enough. It's not big enough. It's not accept, accent, accentuated enough. Right? So if I wanted to say, you know, people can, Bob, sit down anytime they want and get into a comfortable trance. Um, that's probably noticeable. But if I think I'm doing it that, I say, people can, Bob, sit down anytime they want and go into a light, comfortable trance. Um, and I think it sounds like in my head that I did it that way. But then when I listen to the recording, I notice it wasn't so big. It wasn't so noticeable. And so a really great way to practice this is to record it. And thank goodness today, that's easy. You know, a few years ago, you had to have a tape recorder. You had to have some sort of apparatus. You had to buy special. You had to buy a special thing, a tape recorder. You had to go out and get one with some tapes and microphone and a battery and all kinds of stuff, right? Today, you just walk around with a recorder in your hip pocket all the time, right? Your your phone does this. You can record on your phone. Sometimes much better recordings than you could have done on that tape recorder, to tell you the truth. And it's so easy to practice. So practice, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's an opportunity to practice. Um, Say certain things. See if you can get a particular inflection in mind, something you want to tell your client. Write out an embedded command and practice saying it so that it sounds like you're telling them to do something. Now, by the way, an embedded command is always telling them to do something. So if I said to Bob, people enjoy sitting in a chair Sitting in a chair, Bob. Sitting. You know, that doesn't tell Bob what to do. I, I have to say, people can enjoy uh, sit down. <laughs> I don't have to tell him to sit down. That wasn't proper sentence structure, you probably noticed. But I'm still, sit down, Bob. I have to tell him to do something. So your commands will always be on a verb. On a verb like sit or go or do or hear or get or understand, you know, some verb like that. You're telling them to do something. Now, I also want to say this tempo is really important, isn't it? That means the speed with which you speak. When I'm sitting back in my chair and getting real comfortable and talking with the client who's maybe going to go into hypnosis. 
my tonality naturally will start to slow down. My tempo will slow down. My tonality will tend to get a little softer. And the tempo certainly does slow down. Now this kind of way of talking with someone is very conducive to relaxation. And it is very congruent with relaxation. Because when a person is relaxed, we tend to, you know, talk like this, be like this. Now, if you're delivering a very stirring talk to audience, if you're doing a motivational speech and you talk kind of like this, it may not hit the mark quite the same way you'd hoped when you wrote it. And maybe you wrote it late at night after some brandy and sitting in front of a hot fire. <laughs> you know, so it sounded good to you. But it's not going to come across in the way you want it to do. If you want to do something that's motivational, what were we saying before? you got to go first. You got to put yourself in a motivated state. You got to feel up. You got to maybe have some coffee, you know, have some, you know, high test. I don't know. You know, make your move. Put yourself into a state where you're feeling it yourself. You're feeling that sense of motivation. You're feeling that sense of excitement. You're feeling that sense of being, you know, up and jazzed in a totally motivated state. You got to go first. And then your voice will do what's appropriate because it's natural. And you can also be aware of your tonality. You must, in fact, be aware of your tonality. If you're going to be an effective communicator, remember, the statistics may not be accurate, but they're pretty darn close. The tonality is is much larger percentage of what gets communicated than the word choices themselves. You might have written a great speech last night after a couple brandies in front of that fireplace, but if you're talking to it like, and now I want everyone to jump to their feet and cheer, make your move and celebrate, you know, it, it, it's not really going to be that effective. You got to have it in your voice. You got to have it in your voice. And that's true with a one-to-one -one conversation as well when you're talking with your coach clients. You need to be able to have that sense of congruency in your voice, have that sense of, you know, be in the state you're attempting to elicit. Be there. Get into that state you're trying to elicit. If you're trying to get them f to feel, you know, like they're totally loved, you got to be in a state where you're feeling that state yourself. Remember a time when you felt totally loved? You know, when, I don't know, you're being held in a certain way and things were just, just so right. Remember that? Not just to take that feeling on now. Right? You want to elicit it with the tone of voice. So it's the way you say things. So this has just been a little, you know, short introduction to the concept. But hopefully you've gotten it. Hopefully it's come across the footlights a bit with my tonality. Hopefully my tonality has been good enough to get the message across. I certainly hope so. And I certainly appreciate you tuning in to listen. And I hope you do so again. Thanks very much. I hope to see you again at the next Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Well, that does it for another episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed having you here. Hey, if you want more information about Sleight of Mouth, you can find it at EssentialCoachingSkills.com, or you might even check out SleightofMouth.org. That's a nice website, too. Thanks. Stay safe. Stay curious. <laughs>